physics that's usually not appreciated even by people that, you know, get degrees in physics and are not necessarily quantum experts, you know, but that have spent quite a bit of time studying quantum physics. It's sometimes not really appreciated that the wave function is the same thing as the, the particle that ultimately comes out of a measurement. And because the, the atom and its wave function are the same thing, an atom can be in two places at once, or three or four, or actually an infinite number of places at once. The observation collapsing the wave function is what creates, literally creates, the atom. Now, um, let's give an example of the, the weirdness of a quantum measurement. Let's take, uh, this is a penny, and you can slice this penny two ways. You can slice the penny down the, uh, right down the middle, and you can get the Lincoln on the front and the memorial on the back. Or you could call this uh, thing chopping the penny in half, where you have the top half of the penny and the bottom half of the penny. So I'll call this a slice, and I'll call this a chop for the, uh, the experiment, the thought experiment. Assume we have a mutual friend called Niels. This, for fun, call him Niels. You might know why. We, we, he has two machines that slice, chop, and mail out pennies. One machine is labeled classical, and the other is labeled quantum. Now, when he sets the classical machine to slice, the cut is parallel through the penny, so that you wind up with two thin coins. One has Lincoln on one side, the other has Lincoln Memorial on, on the other side. When he sets the classical machine to chop, the chop is perpendicular to the penny, resulting in two half-moon-shaped half pennies, one with Lincoln's head, the other with Lincoln's shoulders. So now he takes the two sliced pennies, so the two, uh, the two sliced pennies on the top, he takes those, and puts one in an envelope labeled sliced pennies, and he mails one envelope to you and one to me. Now, I open my envelope and I find a thin penny with Lincoln on it. So I can safely infer that your envelope contains a thin penny with the Lincoln Memorial on one side. And sure enough, when you open your envelope, you're going to see, if I have this in my envelope, you'll have that one. All right. Well, now my friend Niels takes the two chopped pennies and puts one in each envelope labeled chopped pennies. Again, he emails one to you and one to me. Now, I open my envelope and I find a penny with Lincoln's head in it. So this is what's in my penny. And sure enough, I guess that you're going to find the bottom half of the coin in yours, and that's indeed what you find. All right, no big mystery here, kind of boring. Now, one day I get an envelope with the word quantum written on it. And I figure this might be important, so I call Niels and I ask, um, Niels, what do I have? Do I have a sliced penny or a chopped penny? And he says, well, <clears throat> this time uh, I use the quantum machine on this one, not the classical machine, so it's your choice. I say, ah, uh, well, uh, what do you mean? You've already sliced or chopped the penny and mailed it to me. I've got it in my hands. How can I change that now? He says, well, the quantum machine is special. It processes a penny, and it mails out the pairs in unlabeled envelopes without anybody looking at the pennies. The process does not get turned into a slice or a chop until somebody looks at the coin. Uh, do you mean to say, I ask, that I can decide whether I've got a sliced penny or a chopped penny in the, that envelope and magically, I will get one or the other. That's correct, says Niels in Danish. And as soon as you open the envelope and look at whether you've got a sliced penny or a chopped penny, guess what? The other half, the correct other half, will be what your buddy over there is going to have in his envelope. Uh, but I say, it's already been sliced or chopped. He says, no, the quantum machine only does, that part of the, only does part of the job. It correlates the two halves, but it takes your consciousness to complete the process. You get to decide which way the penny has been halved when you open the envelope. Now, this very same thing can be done, of course, not with real pennies, but it can be done with, uh, with quantum objects, such as photons. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to talk about the Bell inequality, and more importantly, a new inequality that you might never have heard of called the Leggett inequality that was recently measured. It was actually formulated almost 30 years ago by, uh, by uh, Professor Leggett, who was a Nobel Prize winner. But it wasn't tested until about a year and a half ago when an article appeared in Nature that a measurement was made by this prominent quantum optics group in, at the University of Vienna, read by, led by Anton Zeilinger, in which they measured the Leggett inequality, which actually goes a step deeper than the Bell one and rules out any possible interpretation other than that consciousness creates reality when the measurement is made. Now, in the quantum enigma, of course, you don't have coins, but you have twin state photons that don't have any particular polarization until the polarization of one of them is measured. So twin state photons can be entangled in a state of identical polarization, but really have no particular polarization until you measure it. It's the observation of the polarization of one of the photons as being, say, vertical or horizontal 
that instantaneously collapses both photons to vertical polarizations. And that's true when they fly apart. You create a pair of photons, one flies this way, one flies that way. I make a measurement over here. That measurement, and the kind of measurement I make is determined by what I decide over here, that measurement will then be reflected in what this coin over here is going to do, even though they're flying apart at the speed of light, can't communicate with each other. Quantum probability is not the probability of where the atom is or where a photon is. It is the objective probability of where you will find it. The atom was not in the box, if the box is where the atom is, the atom was not in the box before you observed it to be there. And Heisenberg had this to say, these are Werner Heisenberg's words, but the atom or elementary particles are not real. They form a world of potentialities or possibilities rather than one of facts or things or facts. Let's look at the Bell inequality. If you have a quantum object that has a spin, then you can choose to measure the spin in any given direction. And what you'll find is that whatever direction you choose, that spin is going to be either up or down. By up, I mean if it's spinning like this, the axis points up. If it's spinning like that, the axis points down. So you, have a, you actually have two particles that are entangled with each other. And I'll tell you in a second why we have two instead of one. So one of them flies off in one direction. I choose to measure its spin, say, in this direction and call that direction A. So I measure that. Now, there are also two other directions I could, me could measure, uh, B and C. They're arbitrary. I can choose them in any, any way I want to, but there are two other possible directions I could measure. But having measured this one direction, quantum theory says I can't measure the second one. But I can measure the second one indirectly because if the two particles were entangled, its partner over here is guaranteed to have the opposite spin. Sometimes the same, sometimes the opposite, depending on which, which, which kind of particle you choose. But let's assume it's exactly the opposite spin. Now I can make a measurement on this one in some other direction, some second direction, call it B, and I know then that if I measure this one to be in that direction, then this one over here would be in this one, the opposite direction. So I've determined two directions for this particle over here by virtue of a direct measurement and by virtue of a measurement of its partner in a different direction. So I can write out these probabilities. The probability of measuring, probability of measuring, say, spin up in direction A and spin down in direction B is the probability of measuring spin up in direction A, down in direction B, plus in direction C, which I don't know, which I never measured, and again, the, plus the probability of spin up being positive in A, a down in B, and in the other direction in C. And as you, with a little bit of mathematical manipulation, you can show that this plus that equals that one plus something. And the fact of the matter is that something is positive. It's always got to be positive. You can't have negative probabilities. Therefore, this equation leads to an inequality, that the spin in this direction A and direction B, plus the spin in direction B and C, it has to be greater than or equal to the spin in direction AC. So this is the Bell inequality. This is what's predicted if particles have an intrinsic spin before you look at them. Now, as it turns out, quantum physics has a, uh, a rule that says that if you take the spins in two different directions, now this is the, this is the formula that tells you what the probability is of finding um, the, uh, if you have a whole distribution of particles, finding some fraction of them separated by some angle theta. As it turns out, if you put this formula into the Bell inequality, the Bell inequality is violated. The Bell inequality is not true. And the Bell inequality is based upon the idea that spin is something that's intrinsic, that's, that's not dependent upon your measuring it, but it's there all along, and you just choose to measure it. So it's there when the particles were were joined together when they were made to fly apart. There's the, 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 the spins in the different directions are inherent to the particles, and when you choose to measure over here, that's fine, and this one's going to be um, uh, an anti, what's going to be in the opposite direction uh, for any given spin because they were, they were entangled here, but really those spins belong to the particles, and your measurement is, is like a classical thing. You look at something objectively and you measure what it is. But in fact, the fact that the Bell inequality is violated and the quantum rule is followed implies that that spin is not really there until you make it happen. The spin in a given direction is created by your deciding to measure that direction, and then that requires that its partner will be the, in the opposite direction for that spin measurement and have its own angle of spin in a different direction, which then this one would have. So the Bell inequality is telling us, or the violation of the Bell inequality is telling us that it's the observation that's creating the reality. 
Now, as it turns 